a quick reminder of predictive versus effect size models. So we've recently just discussed this, but a reminder that when building an effect size model, where we want to estimate what effect does x1 have on y, right, or what effect does some variable have on some health outcome, it's important that we identify confounders and include them in the model so that we can adjust for these. Okay, it doesn't matter if they're statistically significant or not. If a variable is a confounder, we should include it in our model. It's also important for us to include effect modifiers. If the effect that the exposure has on some health outcome changes depending on some other variable, right? if the effect of exposure is different for males and females, then we should report that. And we should report what is the effect of exposure for males, what's the effect of exposure for females. When building predictive models, since we put um, not much emphasis on interpreting the coefficients or interpreting what effect does a variable have on the outcome, we don't need to worry about confounders. If a variable increases predictive power, if it's good at predicting the outcome, and it's available at the time of prediction, we should include it in the model. And so the emphasis there is on um, building predictive power, or a model that's good at predicting the outcome, not on interpreting individual variables' effects. I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about um, model building strategies and some of the considerations that go into this. As noted, the way we decide which variables should be included or excluded from the model really depends on if we're building a predictive model, right, something to try and predict the outcome, or an effect size model, estimating the effect of some exposure on the outcome. Um, we're not going to implement any of these strategies. We're not going to go through the exercise of how to select variables you know, hands-on. What I think is it's important that you're aware of these considerations. What um, considerations go into building a model and selecting variables when it's predictive versus when it's an effect size. We've noted for effect size models, we want to identify confounders, effect modifiers. We want to include the confounders so that we can adjust for them. And we want to include the effect modifiers so that we can get a correct understanding of the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. In predictive models, our focus really is on getting variables that are strong or good predictors of the outcome. One note I want to make is we don't want to just include every variable that we have. So we don't want to just say we've got you know, all this data and let's fit a model that uses every x variable we've recorded to try and predict y. And you will see this done in practice. You'll see it done a lot, but it's a bad idea to do this. You should not just fit a model that includes every variable you have. And we'll take a look at why this is. Okay, we're going to do it for two examples. The first one is going to be that estimating the body fat percentage data set that we introduced earlier. So we'll look at that. And then the second example is I'm going to go into the statistical software R and just simulate some data and try and show you what happens there. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is take a break from these slides. I'm going to go into looking at R and working with some data and trying to show you what happens when we just include every single variable in the model without trying to think about which ones should go in and which ones should not. So let's take a look at some data and, and see this stuff in action. So I've opened up the statistical software R here and we're going to go through a few examples of why it's a bad idea to just include every variable we have in a model without giving some thought as to which variables should go in and which variables should not go in. To do so, I'm going to work with this body fat percentage data. And let's not get too stuck on the R code that I'm using and try and focus on the concepts and the ideas. So let me just import that data here. And then I'm going to show you the variable names. So this data set has an outcome variable of body fat percentage. And to predict that, we can use the age category of an individual, their height, their body mass index, or BMI, or their abris circumference, which is the measure of the circumference around their abs minus the circumference around their wrist. Okay, so just to take a look at um, this here, first thing I'm going to fit a model that estimates body fat percentage using only BMI. It's so using just that one variable. So I'm fitting that regression model here, and I'm asking R to give me the summary output of that model. So we can see here for the model, this is the intercept, and this here is the slope for BMI. So in other words, body fat percentage is estimated to be negative 15.7 plus 1.359 times the BMI. Okay. 
And interpreting this coefficient of 1.359 or roughly 1.36, what does that tell us? When BMI goes up by one unit, we expect body fat percent to go up by about 1.36%. Okay. So that number intuitively makes sense. As BMI goes up, body fat percentage goes up. Now, let's take a look at a model that uses only the abris circumference to estimate body fat percentage. So I'm gonna fit that here, ask for a summary of the model. And again, we can see here's the model's intercept and here's the model's slope. So the interpretation of that slope there, when the abris circumference goes up by one unit, body fat percentage goes up by 0.65%. Okay, and again, this is a relatively intuitive number that as abris circumference goes up, body fat percentage goes up, right? Or as the measure of body size is bigger, the body fat percentage should be higher. Now, what I'm gonna do is just fit a model that uses all of the variables. So I'm gonna estimate body fat percentage using BMI, abris circumference, the height, as well as the age categories. So I'm fitting all of that here and asking for a summary of that output or of that model. Now, what we can see here, the 4.44 is the model's intercept. Here's the slope for BMI. Here's the slope for the abris circumference for height. And these are for each of the age categories, age category two, three, four, and five. Now, interpreting this coefficient here, what's that telling us? As abris circumference goes up, right, as the measure of body size gets bigger, body fat percentage goes up. Let's take a look at this coefficient here. Okay. Now, when everything has been just thrown into this model, we can see this is a negative coefficient. So what's gonna be the interpretation of that? As BMI goes up, right, when BMI increases by one unit, body fat percentage decreases by 0.32%. Now this is clearly a bias estimate, right? As BMI goes up, body fat percentage should not be going down, right? Here's saying the bigger your BMI, the less percentage of body fat you have. That's clearly a bias estimate, okay? And this has happened because well, because we've thrown every variable we have into the model. And essentially what's going on there is BMI is a measure of body size. Abris circumference is also a measure of body size. These two variables are gonna be highly associated. So essentially they're both sharing the body size effect. When we put them both in the model, it's actually ended up that the abris has gotten overweighted and the BMI has been underweighted. Underweighted so much that the coefficients actually become negative. Right? So again, you can clearly see here that this is a bias estimate. As BMI goes up, body fat percentage does not go down. So this is one example of the way things can go wrong when we just throw every variable we have into a model. Let's take a look at another simulated example. Again, just to try and make the point. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a set of 100 observations. Okay? And I'm gonna do so in a way that there's no relationship between any of the variables. So what I'm gonna do is here, I'm gonna ask R to create a Y variable that's gonna be randomly selecting from a normal distribution. Okay, so go into a normal distribution that has a mean of 100, a standard deviation of 20, randomly select 100 observations from there. Okay, so it's just getting me a set of 100 Y values. Now here, what I'm gonna ask R to do is create a variable X1. Randomly select 100 observations from a normal distribution that is a mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Now, if we think in theory, the correlation between Y and X1 should be zero, right? There should be no association between these two sets of randomly selected numbers. And if we look, the correlation has actually come out to be 0.16 just by chance, not zero. So let's continue on with this. I'm gonna get another variable x2, again, just a set of randomly selected numbers. x3, x4, all the way down to x10. Okay, so the idea is I've got 10 variables here that are just a bunch of randomly selected numbers. Now, I'm gonna fit a linear regression model that uses all of these 10 variables to try and predict the y value. Now we know in theory, 
these variables should not be able to predict y at all, right? They're just a bunch of randomly selected numbers. Let's fit that regression model and ask for the summary here. When we take a look at this summary, here's the intercept, here's the coefficient for x1, the coefficient for x2, and we can actually see that even though none of these variables should be associated with the outcome, a few have ended up being associated with the outcome just by chance. Right, so we can see the variable x7 is a statistically significant predictor of the outcome. When x7 increases by 1, y decreases by 5. Again, this is statistically significant. x8 is also a statistically significant predictor. And now we know in reality none of these x variables are related to the outcome. So again, the point here is if we just start to throw a bunch of variables in a model, some are going to be randomly associated with the outcome, even if in reality they are not. We can also see for this model, the R squared, if you remember R squared tells us what percentage of variability in the Y can be explained by our model or the X variables. So here, X1 up to X10 explain 19% of the variability in Y. Okay, and in reality, we know that X1, X2 out of the way up to X10 should explain 0% or none of the variability in Y. Right, these are all just a bunch of randomly selected numbers. So these are a couple examples meant to show you why we should just not just include every variable we have in a model and the way that some things can go wrong when we do this. So it's important for us to mention here that there's a whole set of um, criteria and statistical tools that can be used to try and help identify confounders, effect modifiers. Aside from just the concepts, there's statistical approaches to identifying these testing um, if an effect modifier is statistically significant, and so on. We're not going to discuss these tools. You're not expected to learn how to um, implement these. It's just important for us to understand um, what confounding is, what effect modification is conceptually, and to know that there are tools available to a statistician or an analyst to try and test is effect modification statistically significant. Um, is there statistical evidence to support that a variable is a confounder, and so on. Stick around, guys. There's more to see, and please stay safe.